Chapter 24 On the twentieth of the month, finding it altogether impossible to subsist any longer upon the filberts, the use of which occasioned us the most excruciating torment, we resolved to make a desperate attempt at descending the southern declivity of the hill. The face of the precipice was here the softest species of soapstone. Although nearly perpendicular throughout its whole extent, a depth of a hundred and fifty feet at the least, and in many places even overarching. After a long search we discovered a narrow ledge about twenty feet below the brink of the gulf. Upon this Peters contrived to leap, with what assistance I could render him by means of our pocket handkerchiefs tied together. With somewhat more difficulty I also got down, and we then saw the possibility of descending the whole way by the process in which we had clambered up from the chasm, when we had been buried by the fall of the hill, that is, by cutting steps in the face of the soapstone with our knives. The extreme hazard of the attempt can scarcely be conceived, but as there was no other resource, we determined to undertake it. Upon the ledge where we stood there grew some filbert bushes, and to one of these we made fast an end of our rope of handkerchiefs, the other end being tied around Peter's waist. I lowered him down over the edge of the precipice until the handkerchiefs were stretched tight. He now proceeded to dig a hole in the soapstone, as far in as eight or ten inches, sloping away the rock above to the height of a foot or thereabout, so as to allow of his driving with the butt of a pistol a tolerably strong peg into the leveled surface. I then drew him up about four feet, when he made a hole similar to the one below, driving in a peg as before, and having thus a resting place for both feet and hands. I now unfastened the handkerchiefs from the bush, throwing him the end which he tied to the peg in the uppermost hole, letting himself down gently to a station about three feet lower than he had yet been, that is, to the full extent of the handkerchiefs. Here he dug another hole and drove another peg. He then drew himself up, so as to rest his feet in the hole just cut, taking hold with his hands upon the peg and the one above. It was now necessary to untie the handkerchiefs from the topmost peg, with the view of fastening them to the second, and here he found that an error had been committed in cutting the holes at so great a distance. However, after one or two unsuccessful and dangerous attempts at reaching the knot, having to hold on with his left hand while he labored to undo the fastening with his right, he at length cut the string, leaving six inches of it affixed to the peg. Tying the handkerchiefs now to the second peg, he descended to a station below the third, taking care not to go too far down. By these means, means which I should never have conceived of myself, and for which we were indebted altogether to Peter's ingenuity and resolution, my companion finally succeeded, with the occasional aid of projections in the cliff, in reaching the bottom without accident. It was some time before I could summon sufficient resolution to follow him, but I did at length attempt it. Peters had taken off his shirt before descending, and this with my own formed the rope necessary for the adventure. After throwing down the musket found in the chasm, I fastened this rope to the bushes and let myself down rapidly, striving by the vigor of my movements to banish the trepidation which I could overcome in no other manner. This answered sufficiently well for the first four or five steps, but presently I found my imagination growing terribly excited by thoughts of the vast depths yet to be descended, and the precarious nature of the pegs and soapstone holes which were my only support. It was in vain I endeavored to banish these reflections, and to keep my eyes steadily bent upon the flat surface of the cliff before me. The more earnestly I struggled not to think, the more intensely vivid became my conceptions, and the more horribly distinct. At length arrived that crisis of fancy, so fearful in all similar cases, the crisis in which we begin to anticipate the feelings with which we shall fall to picture to ourselves. The sickness and dizziness, and the last struggle, and the half-swoon, and the final bitterness of the rushing and headlong descent. And now I found these fancies creating their own realities, and all imagined horrors crowding upon me, in fact. I felt my knees shake violently together, while my fingers were gradually but certainly relaxing their grasp. There was a ringing in my ears, and I said, This is my kneel of death! And now I was consumed with the irreprensible desire of looking below. I could not, I would not, confine my glances to the cliff, and... 
with a wild, indefinable emotion, half of horror, half of relieved oppression, I threw my vision far down to the abyss. For one moment my fingers clutched convulsively upon their hold, while with the movement the faintest possible idea of ultimate escape wandered, like a shadow through my mind. And the next my whole soul was pervaded with a longing to fall, a desire, a yearning, a passion utterly uncontrollable. I let go at once my grasp upon the peg, and turning half round from the precipice, remained tottering for an instant against its naked face. But now there came a spinning of the brain, a shrill sounding and phantom voice screamed within my ears, a dusky, fiendish, and filmy figure stood immediately beneath me, and sighing, I sunk down with a bursting heart and plunged within his arms. I had swooned, and Peters had caught me as I fell. He had observed my proceedings from his station at the bottom of the cliff, and perceiving my imminent danger, had endeavored to inspire me with courage by every suggestion he could devise. Although my confusion of mind had been so great as to prevent my hearing what he said, or being conscious that he had even spoken to me at all, at length, seeing me totter, he hastened to ascend to my rescue, and arrived just in time for my preservation. Had I fallen with my full weight, the rope of linen would inevitably have snapped, and I should have been precipitated into the abyss. As it was, he contrived to let me down gently, so as to remain suspended without danger until animation returned. This was in about fifteen minutes. On recovery, my trepidation had entirely vanished. I felt a new being, and with some little further aid from my companion, reached the bottom also in safety. We now found ourselves not far from the ravine which had proved the tomb of our friends, and to the southward of the spot where the hill had fallen. The place was one of singular wildness, and its aspect brought to my mind the description given by travelers of those dreary regions marking the site of degraded Babylon. Not to speak of the ruins of the disrupted cliff which formed a chaotic barrier in the vista to the northward, the surface of the ground in every other direction was strewn with huge tumuli, apparently the wreck of some gigantic structures of art, although in detail no semblance of art could be detected. Scoria were abundant, and large shapeless blocks of the black granite intermingled with others of marl, and both granulated with metal. Of vegetation there were no traces whatsoever throughout the whole of the desolate area within sight. Several immense scorpions were seen, and various reptiles not elsewhere to be found in the high latitudes. As food was our most immediate object, we resolved to make our way to the sea coast, distant not more than half a mile, with a view of catching turtle, several of which we had observed from our place of concealment on the hill. We had proceeded some hundred yards, threading our route cautiously between the huge rocks and tumuli, when upon turning a corner, five savages sprang upon us from a small cavern, felling Peters to the ground with a blow from a club. As he fell, the whole party rushed upon him to secure their victim, leaving me time to recover from my astonishment. I still had the musket, but the barrel had received so much injury in being thrown from the precipice that I cast it aside as useless, preferring to trust my pistols, which had been carefully preserved in order. With these I advanced upon the assailants, firing one after the other in quick succession. Two savages fell, and one who was in the act of thrusting a spear into Peters sprang to his feet without accomplishing his purpose. My companion being thus released, we had no further difficulty. He had his pistols also, but prudently declined using them, confident in his great personal strength which far exceeded that of any person I have ever known. Seizing a club from one of the savages who had fallen, he dashed out the brains of the three who remained, killing each instantaneously with a single blow of the weapon, and leaving us completely masters of the field. So rapidly bad these events passed, that we could scarcely believe in their reality, and were standing over the bodies of the dead in a species of stupid contemplation, when we were brought to recollection by the sound of shouts in the distance. It was clear that the savages had been alarmed by the firing, and that we had little chance of avoiding discovery. To regain the cliff it would be necessary to proceed in the direction of the shouts, and even should we succeed in arriving at its base, we should never be able to ascend it without being seen. 
our situation was one of the greatest peril, and we were hesitating in which path to commence a flight, when one of the savages whom I had shot, and supposed dead, sprang briskly to his feet, and attempted to make his escape. We overtook him, however, before he had advanced many paces, and were about to put him to death when Peters suggested that we might derive some benefit from forcing him to accompany us in our escape. We therefore dragged him with us, making him understand that we would shoot him if he offered resistance. In a few minutes he was perfectly submissive, and ran by our sides as we pushed in among the rocks, making for the seashore. So far the irregularities of the ground we had been traversing hid the sea, except at intervals from our sight, and when we first had it fairly in view, it was perhaps two hundred yards distant. As we emerged into the open beach we saw, to our great dismay, an immense crowd of the natives pouring from the village, and from all visible quarters of the island, making toward us with gesticulations of extreme fury, and howling like wild beasts. We were upon the point of turning upon our steps, and trying to secure a retreat among the fastnesses of a rougher ground, when I discovered the bows of two canoes projecting from behind a large rock which ran out into the water. Toward these we now ran with all speed, and reaching them found them unguarded, and without any other freight than three of the large Galapago turtles, and the usual supply of paddles for sixty rowers. We instantly took possession of one of them, and forcing our captive on board, pushed out to sea with all the strength we could command. We had not made, however, more than fifty yards from the shore, before we became sufficiently calm to perceive the great oversight of which we had been guilty in leaving the other canoe, and the power of the savages, who by this time were not more than twice as far from the beach as ourselves, and were rapidly advancing to the pursuit. No time was now to be lost. Our hope was, at best, a forlorn one, but we had none other. It was very doubtful whether, with the utmost exertion, we could get back in time to anticipate them in taking possession of the canoe, but yet there was a chance we could. We might save ourselves if we succeeded, while not to make the attempt was to resign ourselves to inevitable butchery. The canoe was modeled with the bow and stern alike, and in place of turning it around, we merely changed our position in paddling. As soon as the savages perceived this, they redoubled their yells, as well as their speed, and approached with inconceivable rapidity. We pulled, however, with all the energy, energy of desperation, and arrived at the contested point before more than one of the natives had attained it. This man paid dearly for his superior agility, Peters shooting him through the head with a pistol as he approached the shore. The foremost among the rest of his party were probably some twenty or thirty paces distant as we seized upon the canoe. We at first endeavored to pull her into the deep water, beyond the reach of the savages. But finding her too firmly aground, and there being no time to spare, Peters with one or two heavy strokes from the butt of the musket succeeded in dashing out a large portion of the bow of one side. We then pushed off. Two of the natives by this time had got hold of our boat, obstinately refusing to let go until we were forced to dispatch them with our knives. We were now clear off and making great way out to sea. The main body of the savages upon reaching the broken canoe set up the most tremendous yell of rage and disappointment conceivable. In truth, from everything I could see of these wretches, they appeared to be the most wicked, hypocritical, vindictive, bloodthirsty, and altogether fiendish race of men upon the face of the globe. It is clear we should have had no mercy had we fallen into their hands. They made a mad attempt at following us in the fractured canoe, but, finding it useless, again vented their rage in a series of hideous vorifications, and rushed up into the hills. We were thus relieved from immediate danger, but our situation was still sufficiently gloomy. We knew that four canoes of the kind we had were at one time in the possession of the savages, and were not aware of the fact afterward ascertained from our captive, that two of these had been blown to pieces in the explosion of the Jane Guy. We calculated, therefore, upon being yet pursued, as soon as our enemies could get round to the bay, distant about three miles, where the boats were usually laid up. Fearing this, we made every exertion to leave the island behind us, and went rapidly through the water, forcing the prisoner to take a paddle. In about half an hour, when we had gained probably five or six miles to the southward, 
A large fleet of the flat-bottomed canoes or rafts were seen to emerge from the bay, evidently with the design of pursuit. Presently they put back, despairing to overtake us.